and a warm welcome from Rotterdam to uh, Rich Medina. How you guys doing? Good. 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 I'm not romantic about hip hop. I'm a card carrier member of Rocksteady Crew. I'm a card carrier member of Universal Zulu Nation. I'm 48 years old. It's not something I've watched and I fell in love with. It's something that I've been participating in my entire life. I've been b-boying my whole life. And when I say b-boying, I'm not talking about dancing. I'm talking about b-boying. So, I'm gonna talk to me about the idea of coming and speaking to you all about the culture and um, I forget the theme that you had on the, the whiteboard take, take over or something. Take over system. Right. Um, I'm going to unpack that for you. Uh, I'm going to get into a whole bunch about me. I think you'll learn who I am as we go forward. But considering why we're here, I thought it would be best to <coughs> start this discussion with a history lesson. Uh, in the moment, I'm in the middle of teaching a semester at Lincoln University. Uh, the course is in the history of hip hop. I also teach American race relations from 1850 to the Harlem Renaissance at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. And I teach hip hop 101 at Cornell University. So uh, my lifestyle and my education have met in one place. So this is not a fucking game for me. I'm not out here to waste your time. I'm not out here to fuck around and pansy ass with your feelings. So the shit I'm gonna say, you ain't gonna like it. <laughs> Change is messy in the middle. You know, you guys wanna take something over? There's a way to do that. But if you step to the establishment as if the establishment is the asset, you put in the cart before the horse. You're the asset. <clears throat> so before I even get into my presentation, I want to fix all of that fucking language now. I'm sorry, sweetheart. bullshit like this for the rest of your life. I swear to God, it's rooted in positive. Um, you don't go to the establishment, first and fucking foremost. You do not go to the establishment. The establishment comes to you. All right? And with that being said, I would like to share a piece of the class that I teach at Lincoln University to lay a foundation. Um, like I said, I, I grew up 40 minutes south of Manhattan. <laughs> I've been partying in New York City my entire life. I'm 48, I'm the second generation b-boy. All the original b-boys in their late 50s, early 60s, the generation is 20 to 25 years. Those guys are 20 years older than me. I'm second generation. And uh, I'm here to share some things with you that are about the root of the culture that maybe you've seen bits and pieces of the story or heard it stated in certain ways, but we're gonna unpack it in a different ways today. So, <clears throat> some essential questions. How do we define hip hop? And why is it more than a musical genre? Anybody? Yes, sir. Um, I think you define it in the sense of culture. Like you define uh, most things where a group comes together to create something or to live a certain way. Uh, it's more than music because it was generated to be more than music. It was a lifestyle, uh, uh, something to, to do, like uh, graffiti or something, the, the way you speak the language. I think that's the way to define and see about the person you are. Good answer. Anybody else? 
I would like to add there's also a value system embedded in hip hop and it makes it more than just musical genre. Absolutely. <coughs> hip hop is made up of four tenets. The four tenets of the culture are DJing, B boy, or what some people would call break dancing, MCing, or lyricism, and graffiti art. A great deal of people in the first generation would say that there's five elements. The fifth being knowledge of self. What knowledge of self tells you is what you will not tolerate. To my point about not going to the establishment. You have to have your knowledge of self together. We're going to talk about what the origins of hip hop are and who the originators are. Why is hip hop and the culture it produces meaningful? And I teach this class in America, so I didn't edit it, but in worldwide society and politics. Why? Why is that? It speaks to a certain group of people. Does it speak to a certain group of people, or is it created by a certain group of people and speak to everyone? Yeah. <laughs> so, same point, yeah. different language. It's a perfect example of the point that I'm trying to make about how we have to shift our vocabulary when we address these things. Right? You're right. You're right. But have to turn it around. It's made by certain people, <coughs> but it speaks to everybody. Mm -hmm. White people from other countries that don't speak the language love the culture. You can go to Japan and see a marshmallow in a cartoon rhyming in Japanese. Is that because of Japanese people? Absolutely not. It's because of niggas and Puerto Ricans <laughs> in the United States. We're going to use all the colloquialisms. I'm not going to clean none of it up. Not a bit. What do you guys think of when you hear the term old school? Think of names like Grandmaster Flash, After Bambada, Cool Hurt, Treacherous Three, Funky Four Plus One More, Curtis Blow, Sugar Hill Gang, Melly Mel, Spoonie G, Zulu Nation, Black Spades, Chingalings, Wild Style, Style Wars, Warriors, all old stuff, right? Super old. This, excuse the graininess of the picture, this is an aerial photograph of the Bronx. The five boroughs in New York, the Bronx is the only land-bound borough. All the other boroughs of New York City are peninsulas. The Bronx is the only landlocked borough. Because it's landlocked in the early, late 19th century and the early 20th century, the land was set for urban development. There's a point about gentrification and all of this that we're talking about. In the big boy terms, they call that urban development. So that means all the immigrants, Irish, Russian, Polish, Czech, the Latin diaspora, and black people from the South who had left the slavery system and the sharecropping system come to the North or up the Midwest to Chicago and other places to get away from the oppressive disposition of the slavery system and the oppressive disposition of the sharecropping system. So contrary to popular belief, the Bronx in the early 20th century was a melting pot. Poor blacks that migrated from the South. You have folks of regular to lower income who were coming into the country and coming into the state from other places to find opportunity. So there was a point where there's a whole different level of integration going on than you would have thought. The Bronx is divided by the Bronx River into a hillier section in the west and a flatter eastern section. East and west street names are divided by Jerome Avenue, which is a continuation of Manhattan's Fifth Avenue. That's the old Yankee Stadium. 
Like I said, much of this land was slated for urban development in the 19th to 20th century. And many immigrants from Ireland, Germany, Italy, Puerto Rico, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Jamaica, as well as African American migrants from the South, flocked to the area of New York, making for a cultural mix like none other in the United States at the time. <coughs> That's the old Yankee Stadium. That's the new Yankee Stadium. The Bronx contains one of the five poorest congressional districts in the United States of America. So you see movies like Fort Apache, The Bronx, Blade Runner, Wild Style, Style Wars. The depiction of the Bronx that you see there is blighted and torn down, is what it was, right? To my point about it being landlocked, the Bronx is in the north. Staten Island is a full-blown island. Queens sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean. Brooklyn sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean. Manhattan is tied to the boroughs by the Hudson River on both sides. On the Queens side and on the New Jersey side. Let's talk about the South Bronx. So, despite the beautiful landscape you saw in those beautiful images, they had a sharp decline in population. Livable housing was hard to come by. The quality of life in the late 1960s and early 1970s was rough. By the 1980s, films like Fort Apache, The Taking of Pelham 123, solidified the Bronx as a national symbol of urban decay. We had a point earlier where we were talking about coming from nothing. I'll just show you what coming from nothing is. There's a gentleman by the name of Robert Carroll who wrote a book on another gentleman named Robert Moses. Is anyone here familiar with who Robert Moses is? Who's Robert Moses? Um, an urban planner who designed the um, um, Bronx Expressway that um, tore up several communities. Uh, um, and there was a significant Jewish community, Irish community, living in those parts where the bridge, uh, uh, the highway was built. built. Um, subsequently, there was an exodus of people, of, uh, uh, white people, uh, uh, light complexion people. And um, the ghettoization of the Bronx was triggered by that piece of urban development. And in some sense, people call him, call him the architect of hip-hop because of that. And so Fantastic. Quite sinister approach, because if you hear, if someone's called the architect of hip-hop, it has this romantic view, etc., etc. But that was uh, Mr. Moses. <laughs> uh, and he was inspired by uh, the, the grandfather, of, or the, the godfather of urban planning, Le Corbusier, who had a vision of what metropolitan life would look like had big plans for how uh, Paris should be redeveloped in, in the post-war era. There's a reason um, why Paris is as big as this. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, um, but Robert Moses took that plan with a slight, a significant different approach. And so the, the towers you see, the, the projects themselves, are part of that uh, design that Le Corbusier uh, initiated. Right? Fantastic answer. Beautiful answer. You are 100% correct. Robert Moses <laughs> is widely known as the king of architecture. What made him the king of architecture was that Robert Moses created what we know as the New York City housing projects. You would think, in theory, a penthouse, a group of penthouses on Central Park West is where the city makes its money. That's not where the city makes its money. The city makes its money in the housing projects by stacking people as high as they can in buildings made of brick, no drywall, none of the perishable materials that go into building a house. Put them inside of brick buildings, stack them up, give them the rent relatively cheap, but put as many of them in there as possible. That is the cash cow of the city. Amsterdam makes more money off the Baumer than it makes off of the finest building designed in the city. 
It's the 80-20 rule, right? Mm -hmm. You get 80% of your business from 20% of your customers. That's that in action. <laughs> Not only is he the king of architecture for creating the New York housing projects, but he also, as the brother so eloquently stated, he built what we know as the Cross Bronx Expressway. I'm going to skip something here. This is the Cross Bronx Expressway. Bronx. This is the Cross Bronx Expressway. Cuts across the South Bronx. When the Cross Bronx Expressway was being built, like I said, the Bronx was a melting pot. You had all kinds of middle income families and ethnicities living in one place. They plowed the construction through neighborhoods where people were actually living. You come home from work on a Monday, everything is regular. You wake up Tuesday morning, there are cranes and wrecking balls on your block there to tear buildings down. Nobody knew why. They didn't tell the people. So, the people who have relatives who lived outside of the Bronx or in Nyack, Westchester, White Plains, New Jersey, more often than not, white ethnicities were like, fuck this. We out. We leaving here. Look at how they're tearing the neighborhood up. You know what construction does? Construction brings out the animals. Brings out the mites, the roaches. If you put that in human form, it brings out the hustlers and the people who are looking to take from people that got what they don't got. Not because they're bad people, but because they're fucking hungry. They haven't had anything to eat today. You look like a steak sandwich to me. I'm taking that. In the midst of all this, this is going on. Those criminals, color don't discriminate, hunger don't discriminate, right? So they're all types of criminals. But the white folks who had the opportunity, whether it's for family that lived outside the Bronx or the financial means to uproot themselves, did. And who was left? People of color with no money. During that time, very grainy picture, but the Bronx has the highest rate of arson in the world. Everybody knows what arson is. Mm -hmm. Setting of fires on purpose. Mm -hmm. Landlords were burning their buildings on purpose because if the building is at 30% capacity now, it, it, I can make money burning the building down rather than spend money trying to keep the standard of living of the people who have stayed at a sustainable level. So, God forbid, your woman is at home and you're out working and the building catches fire, that fire wasn't an accident, that landlord leaves with the bread, you're left either with an apartment at the top of a burnt out building or you get burnt the fuck up. You're a casualty of war. By the 1970s, the Bronx was plagued by a wave, wave of arson. Burning of buildings was predominantly in the poorest communities, such as the South Bronx. One explanation of what occurred was that landlords decided to burn their low property value buildings and take the insurance money, as it was more lucrative to get insurance money than to refurbish or sell a severely distressed building. The Bronx became identified with burned out buildings, poverty, and unemployment. Out of 289 census tracts in the Bronx borough, seven tracts lost more than 97% of their buildings by fire. Coming from nothing. People live here. People are raising children here. People are trying to move their lives forward here. Some of them had no choice but to stay. They can't go anywhere. This is where hip hop comes in. When you talk about Grandmaster Flash, Cool Herc, 
Africa Bambada, the area that I just explained to you is where they lived. There ain't shit there for resources. We're talking about what we're talking about in a government subsidized space. Is that coming from nothing? This place is run on subsidy, correct? Yes. I challenge you guys to appreciate that. When you talk about coming from nothing, it sounds romantic. Because nobody in here is paying this rent. It's a big deal. It's a big, big deal in order to feed the agenda that you're here for. I'm not saying this as a wag of a finger. I'm saying this as perspective. You build a house from the ground up, right? All right, the basement's done. You see the basement now? Cool, now we gotta put the floor on. <laughs> this is 1520 Cedric Avenue. On July 5th, 2007, this unassuming building just north of the Cross Bronx Expressway and adjacent to the Major Deegan Expressway was recognized by the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation as the birthplace of hip-hop. <coughs> 1520 Sedgwick Avenue. The reason that is, is because of the gentleman on the right. Anybody know who that is? I think I halfway heard it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> the gentleman in the dark glasses on the right is DJ Cool Herc. Herc was born in Kingston, Jamaica. His name is Clive Campbell. He's the first of six children born to Keith and Nettie Campbell. Growing up, in, growing up in Jamaica, he saw and heard the sound systems of the neighborhood parties and dance halls with the accompanying toasting done by the local DJs. Does anybody understand the term toasting? All right. In Jamaica, in sound system culture, there's always a <coughs> DJ and an MC. In Jamaica, he's called a toaster. How y'all doing? How y'all feel over here? How you feel over there? I think the party's on the left side, or maybe the party's on the right side. How y'all feel out there? Throw your hands in the air, wave them just like you don't care. That's toasting, right? By the time he emigrated with his family at the age of 12 to the U.S., he had already been bitten by the musical bug. The working class family settled in the Bronx, and there was already a community of other Jamaicans, and they lived at 1520 Sedgwick Avenue. In 1520 Sedgwick Avenue, Cool Herc would throw parties, jams, because he came from Jamaican sound system culture. The sound system was pretty loud. That's kind of the whole disposition of sound clashes. It's a sound clash. Whose sound is better? Is it King Tubby or is it the Whalers? Whose sound is louder? When you go to a sound clash, what they are trying to do is drown each other out with volume and play the most current rhythms with the most clever toasting done over it. When Herc came to the Bronx and began throwing these parties, he would DJ and toast the party himself. But Herc began to develop a style of presenting music that was unheard of prior. And here comes the notion of the breaks. In music, in every song, there is a segment of the song called the break. In the break, all the instrumentalists fall back, except for the drums. At that point in the song, if you dance, that's where you get busy. Break dancing. Be boys, be girls, break boys, break girls. That came from Cool Herc bringing forward the idea that 
This break on this song is only eight bars long. So I'm going to get two copies of that record and I'm going to keep that break going. For a long enough time, if there's ten B-boys here, everybody got to get a chance to smash on this break. Or I'm going to put the next break on that's a little bit higher energy to up the energy in the room for the next round if I want to cut them in half. Playing eight bar breaks back to back, unless you grow an arm out your chest, <laughs> how the hell can you MC as well? Enter the gentleman on the left. The gentleman on the left, his name is Coke LaRock, one of Herc's best friends. One day, at one of his parties at 15, 20 Century Gavin, he's like, man, I can't keep the break rocking and be on the mic. Can you do that for me? Enter the American MC. Unheard of, never happened before. In the Bronx, in a building halfway burnt out, on a block full of buildings, fully burnt out. And who's outside those buildings and who's in that area? The black spades, the chingalings, all the prostitutes, all the pimps, all the hustlers looking for an easy vic. It ain't the easiest place to get around in. Anybody under 50 years old that tells you that they were in the Bronx when all of this shit was going on is full of shit. When they tell you that, you ask them, what train did you take to get to the Bronx? And once you got to the Bronx, who walked you through the neighborhoods that you needed to walk through to get to that place? Right? Back to that we thing from earlier. It's very careful. You gotta be very, very, very careful with that inclusion thing. Because it will get called. And nine times out of ten, it's gonna get called by somebody with less to lose than you who can take a punch better than you. That's how that goes in the street. I ain't even a street guy, but that's how that goes. This is a photograph of the first ever party flyer with <laughs> DJ Cool Herc. Check out the language. <laughs> Again, this is a party in the community center of 1520 Central Avenue. Hold on, make sure you understand what I'm saying. This is the building. The community center is to the back, back corner. There'll be a room this big. Everybody's there. Mr. Johnson from the fifth floor, the lady from the third floor that's always rapping on y'all when y'all in the back, she's like, <laughs> Every fucking body's in the party, right? A DJ Cool Herc party, back to school jam. <laughs> Where? 1520 Sedgwick Avenue, in the rec room. August 11th, 1973. In America, school starts the day after Labor Day, which is September 5th. 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. 25 cents for the lady. <laughs> 50 cents for the fellas. <laughs> Given by Cool Herc. Special guests Coco, Cindy C, Clark K, Timmy T. Oh, by the way, school's still out. <laughs> Anybody got a flyer in their hand? Is there a flyer nearby? This is the dinosaur of this. This is how we inform people where we're going to be, what we're doing, why we're doing it, what it's about, how much it's going to cost you to participate, and why you should be there. Now, we dress it all up, right? This is like a three-piece suit. <laughs> it's like a fucking Speedo. <laughs> right? 
from nothing. From nothing. Piece of fucking notebook paper. <laughs> this was taken to the office in the building and put in a photocopy machine. Photocopy as many as you can. Before Mr. Johnson come back, you know they don't like us in here. Okay, cool, we got a hundred of them. Let's go. And you stick it on every door of every person, every house in the building that you know has something, has somebody in it that's your age. That's who you're promoting to. There's your audience. This is the beginnings of all the shit that we do. This is what we do. This is how we live our lives, correct? This is the beginning. That is from nothing. As a teen, Herc had been DJing for parties in his neighborhood, so why have we determined this party and this date as the birthday of hip hop? Because it's the first party where breaks are played. It's the first party where there's a DJ and an MC in performance together and in that order. The DJ is the lead dog. The MC was just a guy that made sure that the room was engaged. Today, when we talk about hip hop, how often do you see an MC on stage with their DJ anymore? So is that hip hop? No. It's commercial rap music. Rap music is a broom closet in a mansion called hip hop. So another point of emphasis about our language. When we go outside of here and talk about hip hop to the establishment, they think Rihanna videos. <laughs> Girls dancing, rappers, thugs, tough guys, those guys you don't want to be around in the dark have to unpack this vocabulary for those people. They do not hear what's coming out of your mouth. What they hear is their interpretation of what they think it is. And that is the arrogance of class. And that is the arrogance of a lack of melanin. I heard the Netherlands referred to as a former colonial power. <laughs> Neocolonial. I'll wage an argument, a debate. The Afrikaners are Dutch. <laughs> Apartheid is a Dutch word. <laughs> On paper, apartheid ended in 1996. That's 20 something years ago, right? Is apartheid over? Former what? If you can agree with me that apartheid is not over, I beg of you to understand that the Dutch are still, to this day, reign supreme in colonial powers. I'm going on a tangent, but I think it's important. <laughs> if it wasn't for the Dutch, there would be no such thing as sea rope. <clears throat> If it wasn't for the Dutch, there would be no such thing as long-faring sea vessels. Because the entire country is 2,500 feet below sea level. In America, we have weed and we call it hydro. In the Netherlands, your entire life functions through hydroponics. The weed's better. Your relationship with the water is better. The vegetables are healthier. Anything that comes from the floor is more bountiful because it is seated in water. That relationship with water is why the Dutch East India Trading Company began going to India and getting spices and then going to Jamaica and getting molasses and sugar cane and making rum and bringing that back to their fellow colonizer friends and selling it at a premium. The people that picked that sugar cane 
and that pulled those spices from the ground were slaves. Former colonial power? I beg to differ. It's only 2018. Apartheid just ended. There are now white landowners in <laughs> South Africa complaining about being oppressed because black people are activating the laws that came into play when apartheid was ended on paper. Yes, sir. And if I might add, as in, I think neo-colonial is a, is a better description of what this system still is. Because if we take a look at the uh, uh, Fay Ose, huh? it all got privatized. And now we have corporations like Unilever, who are the biggest consumers or users of palm oil. We, we find in all types of products. Um, if you go to the supermarket, Albert Heijn, Co-op, Yumbo, it's all packaged in a real innocent way, but that's neo-colonialism right there. Right. So. And the last remaining piece of old colonialism in it is far to pee. <laughs> so, my understanding of Smart to Pete might be a little bit different than yours. I came here in 1996, hanging out with this gentleman over here. It was a winter. We were walking by Dam Square, and in the windows, a giant bobbing head Smart to Pete's. And I fucking lost it. <laughs> As soon as we get past that, I see a dude in blackface with white man's hands, no gloves on. I spit on the ground in front of him. I was ready to fight. It, it made me, gave me an anger that I had never experienced in my life before. An older gentleman tried to unpack the story for me and he said, oh, I think you're misinterpreting this. Schwarze Pete is a chimney sweep. That's why he's in blackface. And I said, I beg to differ, buddy, because if he was a chimney sweep, everything would be black. Why is his suit so clean if he's a chimney sweep? Fuck you. Don't insult my intelligence. Don't insult my intelligence like that. That's old ass colonialism. Laughter at our expense. So, <laughs> language, perspective, we gotta have this. I'm sorry, it took me on a tangent, my bad, it put me in my field. <laughs> <laughs> so, I asked the question, why is this considered the birthplace of hip hop? Because Herc himself said that this was the day that he premiered to the crowd of partygoers his creation, and his creation was the break. It was a back-to-school birthday party for his sister, Cindy Campbell, held in the Recreation Center at 15th, 20th Century Gathering. After spending months perfecting a new technique involving playing the frantic, quote-unquote, playing the frantic grooves at the beginning or the middle of the song with two turntables, a mixer, and two copies of the same record, Campbell unveiled the technique at his sister's birthday party. This is why Cool Herc is considered the father of hip hop. I told you about Kirk the Rock, Coco Rock. That's the Grandmaster Busy B right there. According to Coco Rock, while he was rapping, at first I would just call out my friends' names. Then I pretended that the dudes had double parked their cars. <laughs> So there's more chance for me to talk to the girls. <laughs> His words. That was to impress the ladies. <clears throat> Truthfully, I wasn't even there to rap. I was just having fun. That guy having fun, doing that, is the reason rap music exists. It's the first step in the story. Everybody knows who this guy is, right? No? 
Flash. Brilliant. This is the legendary Grandmaster Flash of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Back to our point about coming from nothing. The hit record that changed Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five's life and put hip hop on the map musically is a song called The Message. city to get social security but she had to get a pimp because she couldn't make it on her own that's not a romantic story that's how shit is for people who live in blighted places you use that word here blight blight is like uh, you know destroyed you know, the Bronx was in blight. It was destroyed. After the white flight and the arson wave, it's a space of blight. The stories and the things that Melly Mel is saying is everyday life. That is coming from nothing. That is making something out of nothing. We have to carefully deal with that language. Because if we bring this generalized notion of we come from nothing to the establishment, they're going to quietly tell you to go fuck yourself without saying it. Savage skulls, Roman kings, black spades. The streetlight described in the message was based on what anyone could see was happening in the Bronx. With the poverty and crime came a youth population that is underserved by the school system and city agencies. The hip-hop classic film The Warriors is a cinematic rendering of some of the gang violence that was erupting daily. First formed as the Savage Seven, the gang known as the Black Spades originated in 1968, Junior High School 123 on Morrison Avenue in Soundview in the Bronx. Essentially, a youth organization, the Spades followed the teaching of the 5% Nation, Malcolm X, the Nation of Islam, and were influenced by the Black Panthers and the Weather Underground. Under the leadership of their original president, David, who was a member of the Nation of Islam, the Spades organized to fight against the racism and bigotry in Southview after the building of the Cross Bronx Expressway. <clears throat> the first division of the Black Spades policed and protected Bronxdale houses, 
from the rise in crime, drug dealers, and heroin addicts who began to take over the community. This is a photo from the Ho Avenue Peace Meeting that took place in 1971. The events leading up to the meeting and just after it are depicted in the 2011 film Rubble Kings. By the early 1970s, the black spades had increased in numbers and members began to lose focus of their original purpose. The black spades and younger members, young spades or baby spades, became violent and other divisions were unrestrained. David didn't like the direction that they were headed, so he stepped down as first division president. Afterwards, the black spades became a full-fledged street gang. You know who the next you know who their leader was when David left? This guy. This is Afka Bambada, the leader of the Black Spades. As it transitioned from a community development organization to a street gang. He was born as Lance Taylor to Jamaican and Barbadian immigrants. Bambada grew up in the Bronx River Projects with his mother and uncle. As a child, he was exposed to Garveyism and was exposed to his mother's extensive and eclectic record collection. Van Bada became a member of the Black Spades and quickly rose to the position of warlord. As warlord, it was his job to build the ranks and expand the turf of the young spades. As a DJ, he could travel to less familiar areas of the Bronx to play records because of his power as a gang leader and only because of that power. He was not afraid to cross turfs to forge relationships with other gang members and leaders. As a result, Spades became the biggest gang in the city in terms of both membership and turf. At a point, Bambada won an essay contest. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking gang leader is joining a fucking essay contest. Oxymoron, right? Or is it? You would think, oh, he's in a gang. They don't do smart stuff like that. I beg to differ. A hustler's mentality is the sharpest mentality in the world because you got to hold down your hustle, you got to hold off enemies, and you got to hold off the law and look like it's not happening. Yes, sir. What was their hustle? Was it like drugs, alcohol? What? Turf, power, drugs, alcohol, prostitution, heroin. Cocaine was a luxury drug at the time. Mm -hmm. The idea of doing cocaine was something you aspired to. That's a downtown drug. <laughs> was this the time that they introduced crack into the... That was the 80s. 80s. Yeah, okay. we'll, get, we'll get to that. Good, great point. He won an essay contest that earned him a trip to Africa. Mm. He was originally supposed to go to India, and that got changed to Africa. Bambada goes to Africa and gets his fucking mind blown, yes. as you can imagine. Coming from the South Bronx, leading the gang, doing everything that he's doing. Writes an essay, wins, and gets a trip to Africa. <laughs> goes to Africa, mind blown comes back to the United States, sees the film Shaka Zulu. Has anyone seen the movie Shaka Zulu? Watch it. It's about a rebel who was a troublemaker, a rebel rouser. He was always fucking with people, always messing up stuff for the community. And then the colonial power comes in to have a parade to show how important they are to the regular people. And Shaka Zulu's like, well, wait a fucking minute, who are these white people? And what the fuck are you doing around here? And then, all of a sudden, all the people that he was tormenting, now he's protecting them. Mind blown, twice. Boom! Holy shit! I went to Africa, that fucked me up with the tribalism, then I watched this movie, and this motherfucker's doing the same shit I do in the Bronx, and he changed his fucking mind. And he saved his people from the white man. I got it all fucked up. I'm using my power all wrong. Enter the Black Spades going from a street gang 
to the Universal Zulu Improvement Agency. <laughs> a step back towards the Spade's original purpose, which followed the Black Panther model. Community development. Our neighborhood's fucked up. There's no after-school programs. It's dangerous out here. We walk in people's moms home from the grocery store. We walk in kids home from school. We teach tutoring, math, science, English, arts, anything we can do to keep these kids from doing the shit we did. The Universal Zulu Improvement Agency eventually becomes the Universal Zulu Nation, of which I am a proud, humble member. First known as the Bronx River Organization and positioned as an alternative to the Black Spades, the Universal Zulu Nation was founded by Bambada on November 12, 1973. Cool Herc's Back to School Jam was August 11, 1973. <coughs> Within six months of that event, the most important gang leader in the city of New York changes his mind about what his job title is and begins a process of uplifting people and going from fighting over turf to challenging each other creatively. Enter the battle disposition of hip hop. I'm not gonna come to your hood and try to stab you up and take the corner. I'm gonna come to your hood, we're gonna play some music, and I'm gonna bust your ass with these windmills. <laughs> oh, your man in your neighborhood is nice with the cans? My man is nice too. And we on eight of the 15 train lines in the city. How much do you get up, pussy? <laughs> it's a whole different fight now, different turf now. Now we fighting about some whole other shit, and it ain't even a fight. It's iron sharpening iron. People who dance are making other people who dance practice. Graffiti writers that are getting up in their neighborhood, now they want to go to another neighborhood and get up in that neighborhood, but they can't go to that neighborhood because it's still gangs and shit. But this train goes through there. I'm going to bang this train out. I'm going to bang the five line out. They're going to know riches everywhere. And that five train goes from the Bronx all the way to the back of fucking Queens. And everybody along the way sees that name. Hence the term all city in graffiti. Interesting thing about graffiti, it is the only component of the culture that is illegal. <laughs> it's vandal culture defacing of public property? Or is it beautifying? Depends on who you ask. If I paid $8 million for this building and you write your little fucking name on the door, you fucking my building up, man. As a person who walks through that neighborhood, it's like, this is so boring. And then I see that thing on the wall, and I'm like, whoa, that's beautiful. I want to see more of that. Where can I get that? I'd pay for that. If I could take it off that wall and put it in my house, I'd pay for it. It's a part of my city. It's a part of the fabric of my city. I'm romantic about the kids that do it because I can't go in the neighborhoods where they are. It's the closest thing I can get to them. Enter the notion of downtown people being curious about what is this little subculture of these little brown kids doing in the Bronx that's so interesting. From nothing. Back to where we were early on, right? November 12th, 1973, Zulu Nation was founded. It consisted of three boys called the Zulu Kings and later formed the Zulu Queens. Bambada, also the founder of the Soul Sonic Force, which originally consisted of approximately 20 Zulu Nation members. Mr. Biggs, Queen Kenya, DJ Cowboy, Pow Wow, Globe, creator of the MC pop and rap style, DJ Jazzy J, Cosmic Force, Queen Lisa Lee, Prince Ike C, Icy Ice Number One, Chubby Chubb, Jazzy Five, DJ Jazzy J, Mr. Freeze, Master D, Cool DJ Red Alert, Sundance, Ice Ice Two, Charlie, Coco, Master B, Busy B, Starsky, Akbar, also known as Little Starsky, 
and Raheem from Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Some ill shit. Mm -hmm. You've heard all these names. I'm blowing through it just to get through the presentation, but you've heard all these names. Now you're beginning to see the weaving of the fabric. The foundation of the house is built. We got the first floor built. The walls are already up, right? Now we got a one-story house we're in with a basement. When we're talking about hip hop, we're talking about the history, and the culture, and the dynamics inside of it. The term B boy or break boy or B girl, break girl, or breaker, are the original terms used to describe the dancers who performed to Herc's break beats. DJ Cool Herc has commented that the term breaking was 1970s slang for getting excited. Yo, why are you breaking on me, son? It was that and a dancer who got busy during the break of a record. He's breaking. He's breaking loose. You're a big daddy cane and set it off. Now break loose. That's a real thing. According to Frosty Freeze of the Rocksteady Crew, we were known as B-Boys. Co-founder of Rocksteady Crew, Santiago Jojo Torres, Rocksteady Crew member Mark Mr. Freeze Lemberger, and Richard Crazy Legs Cologne all used the term B-Boy. Officially founded in 1977, Rocksteady Crew has come to represent the core of B-Boy style and culture and development across the span of hip-hop's existence. Some would argue that the dance styles and establishments and embellishments and b-boying is most known for started earlier than 1977. Movies like Flashdance and others capitalized on and some might say exploited the art form because it was a product of the underprivileged youth in America's poorest ghetto. One only has to take a look at the number of dance crews competing today in international competitions to understand the proliferation of hip hop dance and its subsequent commercial success. The literal backdrop for this growing cultural movement is the graffiti plastered all over the New York City subway systems and the burned out buildings of the Bronx. It was also aided by the budgetary restraints on New York City, which limited its ability to remove graffiti and perform transit maintenance. So they hated it. The people in the establishment hated it, but the city was so fucking broke, they couldn't clean the trains. So they were fucking stuck with it. <laughs> Ill, right? Like, now you see it that way, that's a whole other perspective on it, right? And it's important. This whole idea of taking over. Do you go to the establishment and ask them, hey, you know, you think you can let us in here so we can show you how we're going to take it over? <laughs> We're going to take this shit over, but I can't believe what said. It doesn't work that way. Bring those motherfuckers to you. All these establishment motherfuckers that you want to be down, you want them to see this, you want them to know what this is about, you want them to see the people you lead, and you lead, and you lead, and the people that follow all of you, bring those motherfuckers here. Don't go to them. Fuck where they are. Who cares where they are? When they come here, and they see it, and they respect the diligence, and then they go back to the little fucking ivory tower, they're gonna fucking miss you, man. <laughs> You're the flyest shit they ever seen. Because our lifestyle comes from fucking nothing. These motherfuckers got everything. But you know the problem, in another piece of language that we have to pay attention to, they are consumers. We are makers. You can't go to a consumer and ask them to help you magnify your making. That's like, you can't shoot me and then drive me to the hospital too. <laughs> Fuck you. No, it don't work that way. Right? Trying to paint a picture for how to get these people's attention. 
walking up and knocking nicely on the door, that shit ain't gonna do it. Anybody see the Tupac video? Tupac was talking about his record deal. And he was like, yeah, man, you know, when I came and the first time, you know, I knocked on the door. I noticed there's a hundred people in there. I can hear forks clanking, they eating, going crazy. Guy sticks his head out the door like, what do you want? He's like, I want to come in. Guy says, no. Closes the door. I'll come back the next week. When I come back the next week, I'm like, bong, bong, bong. I know y'all eating in there. I can smell the fucking food through the door. This time, they don't even answer. You can hear people snickering on the other side of the door. They ain't gonna let you in. The third time I go, kick the bitch in, put the banger in your face. That's your food? Bet. It's mine now. Come take it. Fucking dare you. First time I came, I came nice. Right? If I gotta come a third time, somebody get hurt. Might be me. I don't know. I ain't saying I'm gonna come there and be the toughest guy in there, but I'm definitely coming for a fucking fight. I was trying to collaborate. I was trying to connect with you. Use my style and your resources so we can uplift culture. But now, I realize you, Mr. Establishment Guy, don't give a fuck about culture. Why would I ask that man for his own? No good reason whatsoever. But what is a good thing to do, bring him to your shit. Look at this fucking beautiful place. Look at how fucking attentive all of you guys are and everything that you've accomplished and everything that you've achieved. Has the system done anything for you on the way today? Nope. The fuck has the system done for you? Yes, sir. I don't want to be that guy. You <laughs> 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 See, this, this, this whole system is rigged, right? Um, I'm not going to this, uh, not want, wanting to be a part of the system is an important predisposition that we need. But this building, this house, and this building being funded was also a tool by the establishment. Say, here you have some chump change, now fuck off. Exactly. So, <coughs> it's a quota. It's a quota. They don't care. And there are always some of us who can get close to the powers that be and reach a certain level of comfortability. Um, but there's a significant difference between individualistic, individual progress and progress of a collective. And um, in order for us to be aware and to move forward, we need to be aware of that dichotomy as in changing from the inside and changing from the outside. And now that I've already already talking. <laughs> I've been, I had some points, sorry. After. We need to define what coming from nothing is for us. Me, I'm from Somalia. war torn country, the city where I'm from got bombed until 90% of the city was destroyed. I haven't lived through the bombing, but that trauma is a part of my life. We're all carrying types of traumas with us, and some collective traumas. So in order to be aware of where we're going, we need to be aware of that trauma, that intergenerational trauma called migration. So coming from nothing is locally, uh, has its own locality. So, yeah, that. <laughs> and a few other things. <laughs> <laughs> what I just unpacked, for you guys is the birth of the culture that we are here to represent, right? Do you know how hip hop went downtown? Fat Five Freddy, a black downtown guy, brought Charlie Ahern, the guy who made Wild Style, 
Henry Chalfant, the man who made Star Wars, and Debbie Harry, who you all know as Blondie, mm -hmm. to the Bronx, as well as Martha Cooper. Everybody familiar with who Martha Cooper is, mm -hmm. the famous photographer? Mm -hmm. Fat Five Freddy brought them to the Bronx, they did not take the Bronx downtown. When they got to the Bronx and they saw what was happening, they realized that there's a cultural dynamic going on in the country that they are completely ignorant of. And in their arrogance of needing and wanting to know and have a grip on any and everything that's going on in their city, they began to capture images of it. They began to create stories around their discovery of it. Kind of like Christopher Columbus, the guy who discovered a place where there was already an entire fucking country's worth of people. Slumming, right? Hmm? Slumming. You, some would call it slumming. Others would call it being a parasite. Others would call it bloodletting. Others would call it a form of gentrification. Right? But the avenue out of nothing was not attained by going to the establishment that was holding the people in that community back. It was a choice few people in the establishment who were open-minded enough and lacked the fear that stopped most from coming to the area. And when those people got there, they took a piece of it back downtown with them. And all their well-to-do friends said, man, this is something. This is going on right here? I've lived in New York City my entire life, and I had no idea there were even human beings still living in the Bronx. <laughs> The only thing I know about the Bronx is that the Cross Bronx Expressway gets the wealthy people from Connecticut to Wall Street quicker than before when it was there. Because that's why it was built. To get the wealthy folks from the north through that bad area quick, straight downtown to make more. Writer Sasha Jenkins in Of Kings and Blue Collar Writers points out, quote, back when New York didn't have much, the kids had to figure out what to do with themselves. This was before video games and all that, before that black hole we call the World Wide Web emerged. The kids who ran through the cool fire hydrant blast that sprayed temporary relief in the tar boiling summers were adventurers explorers, archaeologists, Picassos, and to a certain extent, vandals. What do bored big city kids do when they're looking for swashbuckling adventures inside of a concrete jungle? They write their names inside subway trains and eventually on the exteriors of said trains. And eventually, the people who fear it pay top dollar to hang it in their homes. Not because the graffiti writers went to them and said, please buy my art. I want to go back a little bit and show you something that I skipped. I'd like to play a few minutes of the intro of Rubble Kings for you. It's a far more eloquent presentation of what I've just said inside of all my cycle battle. So you know I'm not talking out my ass. The Bronx was like a world of its own. In the early 70s, 
70s, man, crime was like the major income of the Bronx. In the Bronx, it was a deep-rooted gang culture. There were gangs literally in every corner. The violence was everywhere. You could feel the tension in the air. You could see the fights across the street. You could hear the shots in the nighttime. That was one of the worst days in South Bronx history. The word on the street was that he was trying to make peace, that he was murdered trying to make peace. And basically after that, the South Bronx foot was out of control. They were running through the streets, they were burning everything. I mean, pandemonium hit. I put out a bulletin and I started calling all the ghetto brothers. Charlie wanted to get the Ghetto Brothers to mobilize the biggest love back in the history of New York. We lost a member that they viciously murdered him out of history. Now it's an eye for an eye. The Bronx was going to be gang in blood. How rumors spread, how news spread, there was not a gang. In the whole of New York that was not aware of what was happening. And there's like the movie The Warriors when the ladies on the radio song, hey boppers, um, you know, you got to make that move. Let's get down to it, boppers. We're gonna have to do better out there. Everybody was tense, but nobody knew what was gonna jump off. What that scene from The Warriors, Can You Dig It? That really went down. That really happened. Can you dig it? I met Charlie in 150th Street, Trinity Avenue. I was with my friend Raymond, it's like a brother, and we grew up together. And I saw this guy taking a wood this thick and going, ah, and I said, wow, I found it amazing. Because so I was into the martial arts. And I said, that is fantastic. I said, I want to be friends with him. That was me. We want to be friends with this guy. I woke up there and I said, hi, my name is Benji. It's 1960-something, I only know they rob, they steal, nobody's going to rob me. So I prepare, I'm ready to take this guy on. I just want to shake your hand. That's Charlie. I said, okay. The moment he moves, his ass is mine. But he's standing there with his hand out and uh, he starts telling me about there's a few guys that study martial arts that he's been watching and he can imagine uh, that I'm a pretty good martial artist. And we sat down and said, what's your style? I'm going to you. Talk to me. And we just talked and talked and talked. I stick out my hand, I put my hand in his and the Ghetto Brothers are one. The 
60s were a time of worldwide social and cultural reckoning, with movements demanding change spreading across the college campuses and the front lines of America's ghettos. It truly felt like the seeds for a full-blown revolution were being sown. This revolution was going to happen. We knew that this was the end of the, of the world order. We thought revolution was possible. For the first time, we had a multicultural movement. For me, it reconfirmed in a strange way my faith in America. But as the 60s came to a close, Vietnam War and racism continued to erode America's soul and fade all optimism. A systematic backlash against organizations like the Black Panthers, coupled with the assassinations of nearly every iconic figure of hope, left the new generation with nothing more than unfocused rage. They killed the king, and then they killed Kennedy. My heroes died in the 60s. The hope is deflated. I was so mad at America. I was pissed. Heard of the troubled 60s? Well, the troubled 60s give rise to the violent 70s. I have a dream. No, you don't. My people, we will overcome. Boom. No, you're not going to overcome. You ain't getting nobody out of this fucking game. Remember the 60s? Now, it was peace. Three years before Herc's party. America's unrest was reflected locally as New York City struggled under the weight of its own mounting crises. Failed vision of urban renewal pushed all but the city's wealthiest to the brink, and a new pessimism and desperation made its home in its streets. Now here was this great city, the international capital of commerce and culture and communications and finance, and it was on its knees asking, begging for help. The city was on the edge of bankers. All through the 70s, remember, industries were departing, jobs were disappearing. If there was a safety net before, the federal government was basically not just ceasing to protect it, but cutting holes in it. Despite the city's financial troubles, in 1970, New York's cultural scene was as vibrant as ever. Construction of the World Trade Center would soon be complete, and the New York Knicks would win their first championship. However, only four miles away due to reckless urban planning, the district of the South Bronx was rapidly becoming a symbol of urban decay around the world. When we were young, we remember Brother Moses. I remember the teacher talked about the guy who was pitching on the area. That day was saying, they were renovating the area. Buildings were being taken out of commission. They gotta go, we wanna build this highway over here. The cross mountains first at one time, that whole area was nothing but houses. Beautiful houses. He takes a wonderful borough that's made up of polyglot. I mean, everybody was there. Ralph Lauren comes from there. And he cuts across, he cuts a huge swath, literally destroying the neighborhoods. This is amazing. I mean, it's amazingly creative, even though it was also humanly destructive that he thought the shortest distance between two points is a line, even if there are actors and people, you know, in the way of the line. And that's when they started to go down. The economy went with them, the, uh, the store owners, everybody just took off. You see a quiet white flight, so everybody was modeling, you know, from the concourse up to, you know, Nyack, White Plains. Come on up, Pops, come on up, you can't stay out here anymore, you know? The roots move out to their second and third homes. The middle class is not far behind. And left will be the poor who require enormous services and who will suffer. Now we can start talking about it all as a break in this timeline. I crime, poor people, greatest unemployment, worst life and the world record for arson. In just 
10 years, more than 30,000 buildings have been set ablaze and abandoned here. You got rats, bugs, no heat, no water. It was tough. Tough. It's like another domino effect, and you know, then you see the burning start. So the uh, landlord wouldn't provide services, and the people had to ultimately move out. And then the landlord burned the building down and got the insurance. You know, having buildings torched was the norm. The Bronx was like a world of its own. The Bronx to us was a whole world. Well, this morning on the way into work, we had a report that the uh, police had located a carcass on uh, in a street on 172nd and Bryant. Turned out to be a uh, stripped carcass of a gorilla. It was headless, and the uh, fur was removed, the skin was removed. South Bronx. <laughs> Why on earth would there be a skinned gorilla beheaded in the street in the Bronx? There's a zoo, right? There's a zoo. It's the Bronx Zoo. Yeah. In the zoo, when animals die, there's a particular medical procedure, certain precautions that are taken when getting rid of the bodies. Because they're, they're, they're wild, wild animals. So obviously there's things that would make people sick should they come in contact with a dead animal. But the city thought so little of the Bronx that it dumped a fucking gorilla carcass in the street. Talking about from nothing, Let's go back to this original point where all of this started. You chimed into the conversation earlier. You know, that bred all the creativity and all the forward thinking and all the energy that went into the things that we now claim as our lifestyle. We all claim to be hip hop. Everybody's claiming to be hip hop. But until you understand this space and equate the desire for governmental assistance and assistance from people in positions that are supposed to be there for us, until you understand that foundation, it's hard to relate how that foundation relates figuratively to what we're dealing with now, albeit in a nice space with mm -hmm. food and the things we need. Yes, sir. So, <clears throat> in this um, history lesson that we're getting, for me, it brings out a lot, or it, it, it broadens my perspective enormously. But one of the things that always stuck with me in hip-hop is the honesty within the music and within spreading the message, which is of unity, of coming together and sharing knowledge. So what would hip hop today have to do to commemorate the movement where it has begun? As they all earlier said, like the commercial way of, of spreading hip hop is mostly to, through commercial rap music. But the whole entirety of the villa that you talked about where is that? How, how can we communicate hip-hop through music, through messages, in a, in a broader, in a bigger, in a more impactful way? Well, first of all, I believe we have to stop going to the people who we want to pay attention to what we're doing, claiming that we're doing what we're doing in the spirit of hip-hop. It's an internal function, right? It's, it's a piece of your fabric. It's, it's who you are or not. You're a dancer, you're a DJ, you're a b-boy, you're an MC, you're a person that operates through a, a lens of knowledge yourself. You dress a certain way, you wear your clothing a certain way, you wear certain types of jeans, certain types of shoes, you cock your hat a certain way. That in and of itself is the representation. The person who's embodying the culture what is it that we do or that we want from these people beyond bread to fund our ideas, right? 
at the end of the day, we want subsidy. We want to be subsidized by these organizations that have the money and have these quota systems set up where they're designated to provide X amount of euro, X amount of dollar towards these diversified, diversity-based programs. Diversity starts here, right? Do I go in there and say, well, you know, I'm black. And you know, I know y'all got some money for some stuff for black people, so, uh, <laughs> right? I sound crazy. We sound crazy saying, yo, you know, it's hip hop. You know, it's important too. We're important too. We want that, we, we need your reach. We need, we don't need them. Look at what everything that's been accomplished. Yes, okay, we're in a subsidized space, but the things that are going on inside the subsidized space are about the culture. They need to come down here and see when there's a room full of kids following dance instruction after school. Because the after school programs that they're being offered are also part of the colonial construct and boring. So they come to a place like this. <coughs> I'm, I'm not, I couldn't really do that, so. We all pay taxes for this money, right? So why should a Dutch National Ballet or Comiosa or another predominantly white organization, a big organization, get all of it? We, it's our money as well. Absolutely, but that money funnels through the government. We ain't in the government. So we don't have any say. What we have say in is the cultural things and the creative presentations that people in those positions aspire to. The women in those places want to dress like you. They want to move like you. They want to understand what's the secret sauce this lady got when she could do that thing, right? There's a way to show them, oh, this is how you do it. That's why you teach classes. Can you get some of those ladies? in here, take a class, go to them and say, hey, we'll give you free classes. We want you to see what we're doing. We know who you are, but I'm not asking you for shit. I'm not asking you for nothing but participation. Are Come you, see us. Are you saying you can't be hip hop and be in the establishment, as we say establishment? I don't think Because I, it, it seems as if you are, <coughs> these are two different worlds and... No, I don't, I don't mean to imply that. I, I can understand why you're saying that, but I could, I could fix that. I, I don't mean to say that you can't be establishment and be hip hop. I mean, I went to Cornell University. I have two Fortune 500 jobs. I teach at yeah. an Ivy League institution. Yeah. I'm in the establishment, but I ain't in the establishment. The establishment ain't in me. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I operate I in that. Feel me? Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the rub. Yeah. That's don't where. Make it change you. Right. So when I'm teaching my classes at school, I talk just like this. I don't come in like a professor. <laughs> no good class, sir. You know, it's 305, Jimmy. You're <laughs> yes, sir. My thing with my students is, I'm not going to tell you to get off your phone. You want to be on your phone when you're in here? It's your brand, homie. I'm here to sharpen your blade. Because when you get out here in the real world, nobody gives up. So make your mistakes with me. And let me build you up. Let me be one of the people in this long line of people who are gonna build you up, sharpen your blade. Then when you go get out there in the real world and that cold wind come around, you got a scarf already because of all this preparation. Think about it like fighting. There's no use in going to a gym where you can beat everybody up. You'll never get better. All the champion fighters that you admire, when they go to the gym, they get their ass handed to them in training. Conor McGregor, Nurk Nurmagomedov, Crow Cop, all these fighters, when they're training for a championship, they're fighting guys bigger than them, they're fighting with their coaches, making them fight under constraints to deal with a certain kind of pressure from somebody who's bigger and stronger than them. Then when they go fight in their weight class, that's why when they come out to fight in their weight class, there's no fear. We get punched in my face by guys twice your size for 16 weeks. 
I've been getting the shit choked out of me by jujitsu masters that I don't speak the language with for 16 weeks. I'm not worried about you. You better hurt me. You better hurt me soon, son, or it's gonna be a long night for you. Any sport, any discipline, anything you do, every player that we admire has a fantastic coach, fantastic training, right? We have to apply ourselves in that fashion. That is a fight. We're not going in there to re request anything. We're going in there to show worth, right? We go in there with our research done. We know what this institution does, who they've given money to before, how much money they've given out, and why. Mm -hmm. Our job is to explain to them why we should be in consideration for the next time they do such a thing. Beyond that, fuck them. Because that's all we want from them. Right? Or are we trying to be establishment? I think that's, that's where I lost you on that point, right? That's where it started to sound like I'm saying you can't, it, they're mutually exclusive. You can only be this or only be that. No, we shift code. Just like the brother said earlier. We shift code. Anybody here could probably walk into Baumer and say the right thing to the right guy and the wolves will leave you alone. Mm -hmm. Or you could walk in a boardroom with the right clothing on and look like a fucking executive. Keep your mouth shut and look like an executive, right? We code shift naturally, organically. That's why these things are so frustrating to us. Because the consumers up in that space, they can't do it. So they don't relate. They don't relate to it at all. Because they only do this thing. I get up at seven, I take a shower, I have my breakfast, I go to work, turn on my computer, I send my memos. <laughs> I powwow with Jim at the water fountain. <laughs> we play golf on Saturdays. My kids go to ballet together Monday through Wednesday. Sally and the girls do yoga on Thursdays. <laughs> and every once in a while, we'll see these young black guys. And they dance so well. And the music is scary, but extremely interesting. <laughs> because we don't do these things at all. But man, they're having so much fun. That looks so interesting, what they're doing. How do you convince that person Oh, is it interesting? Cool. Oh, and you work for an organization that provides money for interesting shit because you're so boring? <laughs> What's your organization's name again? Cool, thanks. You go home, check up on them. Who are they? What's going on? What do they do? How do I step in the side door and walk right into the line where everybody is? In there? By the way, we shift code. We've already been in these establishments. We walk in and out of those buildings and through those people's lives all day, every day, but they ignore us like bums. You know, you walk by a homeless person or a smelly person, you ignore them. Person's like, okay, I need some help, can you help me? More often than not, we are, we are arrogant too. That well, homeless do person. Think something is yes. changing now in this period, um, in this attitude that you are. Uh, sketching uh, because in the public cultural sector all these institutions they are obliged now to um, yeah to express what they do uh, in terms of diversity or yeah or inclusion or whatever so there's a whole I see that there's this uh, movement going on in creating awareness in the institution but it's so slow you know while what's happening in the field is already somewhere else. So I think now the tension is, do we keep waiting until Absolutely everybody not. gets aware at the institute? Be because right. that's also a privilege to take time right. to become aware yeah. and seeing other qualities, right. whether it's artistic qualities. But, but it is because there's this shift now, it's I think the right moment. To yeah, definitely. Yeah. So with the right people. With the right with people, the right because people. there are good people. <laughs> Inside, yeah. If I might add a little bit more, the shift that is going on, uh, 
um, is real and we can view it through a demographic lens that the population of the city has changed a, te a technological lens because of the internet, because of those things the social media we're able to communicate with each other and bypass former institutions we needed to actually wield some power so the whole thing is you can disrupt the status quo with a f uh, by being aware of that, of those uh, different shifts and being aware of a policy shift 2020 the local municipality will be um, uh, reaffirming or uh, drawing up the new policies for the next four years and if you're aware of all those demographic, all, all those cataclysmic changes that are going on in the city you can actually use hip hop as a method as a mind state to transform that whole thing but it starts with self-awareness I'll, I'll use myself as an example to illustrate a, a notion uh, I'm a working class DJ I'm a blue collar working class DJ I'm fucking good at what I do I got a black belt under my shirt but I'm not famous. We all know legitimately famous people. We all have some form of personal relationship with people who really understand fame, right? <coughs> you might look at me a certain way. This guy has done this, he's accomplished that, he's here talking to us. I am not famous. Because I'm not famous, there are people who get booked to play festivals and events that are enormous and they make big long money to do it and they're not <laughs> they don't love the craft they are in it and of it and they are legitimate but they no longer adore the craft. So they do things that that establishment expects of them in order to gain entry. One of those things is making music. When you go to these giant festivals, 90% of the time you are listening to a music producer who was hired as a DJ. All of my famous friends are like, man, you know, you gotta make more records. You gotta put more records out, man. Branding, branding, branding. I'm like, all right. So I gotta make records in order for you to appreciate my ability to string records together back to back and make a record out of four hours. If, after talking to me today, I was to adhere to a model like that, all of y'all would be like, damn, rich change. See how he playing a game now. <laughs> right? Is that fair to say in our new relationship? You would look at me funny if I began to adhere to the model that I have to make a bunch of records in order to get booked at a higher level as a disc jockey. It has taken a great deal of time for my career to expand because my desire is to be booked for the way I sequence songs, not for the way I make records. I'm nice at that shit too. Versatile, fucking ambidextrous. I can go left or right at will, but I prefer the right. It's more fulfilling for me. I'm not going to do some left-handed shit to get a right-handed opportunity. It's beneath my fabric. Also, b-boy shit. Fuck that. I'm gonna get booked where I get booked. And if there's a famous guy on the bill, my entire MO is to eat him alive in front of his fans. That's why I get opportunities like this. That's why I run with wolves like this guy. I'm a wolf. <laughs> Real talk. Real talk.
talk. <laughs> you can make it funny or not, but Pata is supreme on fucking steroids <laughs> by doing it their way. They did not go the typical, oh, can we be down? Down? Nigga, you want to be down with me? I'll be down with you. Your whole fucking crew's corny. Just because y'all got money? Whatever. Y'all corny and you can't fight. Y'all want to be down with us. Because when the shit really get popping, everybody that's up in that thing thing, that, we, that got that money that we want, where you think they coming? For protection. Where we are. And even though a lot of us, maybe we ain't in the hood no more, but you never lost your connectivity. When the shit pop off, I ain't going to the tower. I'm going around the way. They been had the guns loaded. They had the guns loaded and they been throwing their hands in the street for years. No flinch mechanism. And they think I'm smart. I made it out. So I come back and I ain't even got to throw my fucking hands. But fucking with them, I'm going to end up protecting people. I'm going to end up fighting for five guys. Because they can't fight. They lost their fundamentals. They lost their coachability. They lost their trainability. As much as I'm up here in front of you popping off like I know what I'm talking about, I am coached by some of the finest coaches on the planet. And they are my friends who do their own thing. And I admire what they do. And I watch how they operate. And I figure out for myself, how can I apply that discipline to my shit so that I can build my game? Because I wanted somebody to look at me the way I look at some of my friends and the things that they've accomplished. So it's a disposition. It's about embodying what you desire. It's not, man, if I only get this break, you know? The best MCs I know ain't got no record deal. Yes, sir. But do you think it's possible to uh, reach a certain level of success and still remain true to the purpose of it? That's an individual thing. And whose definition of success are we talking about? Are you talking about a success definition through the construct? Or are you talking about a success definition that allows you to look at yourself in the mirror every day and say, yeah, nigga, you're a bad motherfucker. Exactly. But also with like, uh, the people. Because I also have like the idea like, okay, let's say um, you do remain true to the culture, but then you have the problem with the people who always are looking at you to see if you're not uh, selling yourself. And if there's something slightly that, you, that they don't agree with, they put you on the other side. Uh, How do you combat that? There's no Hall of Fame for critics. <laughs> <laughs> Opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one. <laughs> if you can't fight, fuck your opinion. If you ain't about what I'm about, and you ain't not, all, all ships rise in a high tide. If you ain't on a boat, trying to be out here getting somewhere, you give a fuck what you think? None of us should. This ain't about me. I'm using myself as an example to give a perspective that, that broadens the point that I was trying to make and the point that I, that you brought up. I'm, I'm glad you said that because that is not at all what I'm trying to get across. It is embodiment. Me being a DJ, I don't talk about how down I am for DJ culture. I just practice every day. I touch my game every day. That's why I'm a DJ. Not because, you know, DJ culture you know, that's producer culture. I'm, I'm from DJ culture. <laughs> like, fuck that. That's just yibbity yap. You gotta be about it, about it, or not. That shit's on or it's off. It's a light switch. And sometimes we have to be provoked to see it. That's where the coaching thing comes in. This fucking guy, I keep referring to this guy, man. Every time I come to Amsterdam, he's like, yo, man, you ain't opening your mouth loud enough. I swear on everything I love for 20 fucking years, every time I come to Amsterdam, on tour, booked, working, this dude is like, yeah, it was all right. <laughs> That's some shit. When I go home, 
I'm like, was it just all right? Or does he see more in me than I'm allowing myself to see? He's just provoking me to look deeper within. Yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> this discussion is coming from the idea that we have to look to the outside to uh, legitimize or upgrade our fit. Every single grant writing organization, every single art house person, I would relentlessly flyer and promote to them for things that are going on here, not for wanting to do it there. If you get them here 10 times, on the fourth time, they're already thinking about how they can bring this energy into their shit and how they can be Christopher Columbus with it. Somebody wants to fucking discover you. Somebody wants to take you to the rest of their fucking hoity-toity friends that are scared of you. They pay money to see you perform, but if you had on a fucking goose down jacket and a scully and some boots in the wintertime, they'd cross the street. When you walk by the car, they'd push the locks down. You know how they are. Right? Fuck them. Bring them here. Bring them to your shit. Yes? This lecture brought back an MMA fight because you're a black belt. So, so I don't mean literally. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> In the DJ booth, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Goddamn <laughs> skip it. Double fight. But it reminded me of the fight between Habib and McConnor. Perfect. I'm exactly. sure those of people who saw it. Ooh, Habib and McConnor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, McConnor, sorry. Okay. Um, a wrestler fighting a boxer. And then Habib not trying to be a boxer, but staying in his lane and bringing him down the whole time. For me, kind of, that is a metaphor for everything you're trying to say. Right. Uh, well, he brought him down enough right. to use his wrestling to his advantage. Yeah. He actually beat McGregor up on the feet yes. before mm -hmm. he started wrestling him. Yeah. Every round. He won every round. Yeah. Because McGregor was so worried that he would be brought down, yeah. that he couldn't be the best. And all the commentary from Coach Kavanaugh, McGregor's coach afterwards, he said, you know, our strategy was too defensive-minded. Mm -hmm. Even so, the only chance McGregor had to win that fight is a puncher's chance. Yes. Everybody's got a puncher's chance. You can't put no muscles here. When this nerve touches this nerve, the body turns off. <laughs> People think of a knockout, you think power, knockout. No, you could, Pop somebody in a sweet spot, that soft, they're going to bed. <laughs> Namurgamedov, Sambo champion, beginning of every round. He initiated the striking. He beat him at his own game. Now you got him second guessing. Now he's second guessing his game. Now take him out in the deep water. Drag him out in the deep water. Sit on him. See if he can get up. You know, matter of fact, let him up. As soon as he gets back to dry land, drag him back out. Push him down in there. And then he said, now let's talk. Let's talk now. <laughs> now let's talk. Right? So, confidence and aggression is always warranted. Arrogance, if you are not prepared to fight will get your ass whooped. Public. Perfect example. You bring up a perfect example. Margamedov didn't go into the fight selling vocabulary. Selling fights, you gotta talk shit. That's how we sell fights, is it? Or do you sell fights by brass tacks when the cage closes? Two men enter, one man leave. That's how you sell fights. We got enough dickhead personalities in the world to watch. You know, we got that in the leadership. We don't need that shit in the fight game. And what Nemurga Medov did, although against the rules, was fully warranted, fully justified. To your point, George St. Pierre on MMA Weekly just two days ago, he said, 
you got to understand, you don't know the culture that this man grew up in. There's certain shit you just can't say to certain folks from a certain place who have lived a certain life. That is a line. McGregor crossed that line and he got himself smashed. And then the man jumped the cage and jumped on his teammate after whooping his ass because his teammate continued the disrespect. Was the Murgamedov right? Yep. Yes. <laughs> Did he execute it through emotion rather than strategy? Yes. Is that criminal? Not at all. Throwing a dolly through a bus window is criminal. Mm -hmm. Disrespecting an entire religion should be criminal. Then you use the dolly thing as the promotional tool for the fight. And this man is watching the whole lead up to the fight. You're selling the fight by what this fucking asshole did because he's the star boy of the game. Cool. I'm going to bust your star boy's ass. He said, I'm going to fuck your boy up. <laughs> and he smashed him. <laughs> take, the, take the after the ring shit out of it. He manhandled that guy. He didn't just win a fight. He manhandled him. He could have won that fight in the first round. He could have did everything he did in the fourth. He could have did it in the first. He could have did it at will. And he said it in one interview early on. He said, I'm going to take my time. I'm going to play with him. That's exactly what he did. That sells fights. I, you know, needing to adhere to constructs is an ailment. We're all, everybody in here considers themselves an independent. We're all independent, right? I'm an independent contractor. You don't work for no big organization, no big people, or whatever. Why do we want help from them? Then. Why not just go get a job there? Maybe I've been saying it incorrectly. It's not about not wanting anything from them. It's about the manner in which it's requested. I, my bad. I've been making my point incorrectly. It's the manner in which the request is made. Right? I think that's what I was trying, I was fishing for a way to, to yeah, answer. I was fishing for, for where I finally got to when I was answering you. The takeover language, that has to stay in the locker room. You can't take, you guys are all the leaders of your respective spaces, you can't take that takeover talk out there. That's for in here only, right? You actively do the things that are going to allow you to get in the space and possibly get a seat at the table. Takeover is romantic. Takeover takes power, takes money, takes violence, takes weaponry. None of that shit is in play here. This is all cultural upliftment. Language. We have to fix our language. The intent is fantastic. It's exactly what is supposed to be happening. But that tough talk, only here. When you're out in the street and you're dealing with them, I'm an artist. Oh, what do you do? Art. <laughs> <laughs> so why are you here? Well, you're an arts organization. Yeah, we're an arts organization and you do art. And? Yeah, of course. So, as the organization that you are, you do stuff with and for artists. What exactly is it that you do with and for artists? Well, you know what you do with <laughs> Cool. How would an artist or a group of artists find themselves in the opportunity to receive your services? Oh, well, you gotta do this, and you gotta fill out this thing. Da, 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 da. Oh, that's it? That's what I gotta do? That's it? Okay. Anything else? Anything else I need to do as an artist to get something from your arts organization? That's it? Cool. I'll be back when I'm done. And every time you go, 
You go fresh dipped, box fresh, your newest shit. Get a haircut, put the fly earrings on. You got a suit, wear a suit with cufflinks. They don't respect anything else. It's just a code, it's just a shifting of code, right? Shift the code, kill the, kill the, the barrier to entry, then kill them with information once you're inside. Yes, sir. Did you uh, read the, uh, the book, uh, The 48 uh, Laws of Power? Yes. Is, it, is that the, where you get the concept from? Um, when you said, like, when you go outside and they ask you, you say, I'm an artist. Because in that book, there is a chapter that uh, speaks about not uh, uh, acting like you're above the establishment. Right. Acting like you're below the statue to become part of it, to become bigger in the organization and then take over. Oh, uh, sorry, I keep forgetting. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, no, as uh, an athlete, this position never outshine a master. Yes. When you come to the gym, you leave your shoes and your ego at the door. Shut the fuck up. Listen to the coach. Work as hard as possible. Come back tomorrow and do it again. At game time, when you put your uniform on and they call starting lineups and your name gets called, that's what people know. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I can hear the gray matter cooking. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing that I find difficult is these people that are judging our craft aren't in the culture, but these are the ones that decide whether you get the funding or not. So I'm applying for a big one, and if I get it, I can um, invest in myself or pay my bills while doing it. So like totally focus on that thing while not losing your own, um, what's the word? Identity. Authenticity. Yeah. But do it like total, um, oh, I just had the word, shit. Ethics. Morals. Maybe not. <laughs> Foundation. <laughs> Like Cookies. <laughs> like, I'll, it'll come to me, but um, so you want them to invest in you, and you want to do your, your your thing without compromising, because a lot of times what we do is we try to package it in a way that it sounds like with what they want to read or hear or what you want to do, but actually, or maybe I should package it like that, but then also do what I want to do. So, I don't know if you understand my question. So you do what you want to do, but when you explain it, you explain it with the Queen's English. Okay. That's... <laughs> just because you say it eloquently when you explain it, don't mean this shit ain't nasty when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what you're asking. The it's explanation... Only, but it's also difficult because they are the ones... Um, they're not in the culture, so it's also you have to speak to them. But also, I, well, that's not even a question. It's, it's just something that I find difficult. Make sure you surround yourself with people who've done it, yeah. done it, who've done it, who've done it over and over again, so they can help you yeah. through that process. And there's no absolutes. You know, we're all in bed with the devil to agree. Right? It's like what we're saying. Like, like when we battle each other, it's like sword fighting. I'm the DJ too. I'm doing my stuff. They look at me like this. Mix is nice. He goes back, but then I come in, he's like, yo, we got some nice mixes. And then we learn from each other on this sound, this sound. So I'm just practicing my skills. Sometimes if you have like people, the stuff that you don't know, I surround the people, like let me say Texas. I don't know shit about Texas. I surround my people that understand Texas, but also understand my language. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really need. What also is very interesting in this whole thing is that a lot of people, like 80% or 70%, don't know like actually the history of hip hop. I was very concerned first and foremost. If you don't know, like I was actually not born, but this to me, this is something already you need to, this is this is the hip hop house. Mm. If you don't know that I was totally not I was flabbergasted almost. 
Because without that, you don't know where to go. You don't know your own self. And say, this is the hip-hop house. To me, you need to know that first and foremost, all the ground stones. And then second of all, like where do we need places? I need like a good lawyer, taxes. And if they understand my shit, then I can even grow fast further and further. That's why I be with him 20 years in the dojo. And then we became good friends. But we in the dojo, playing the whole time. I need, that's how I uplift my skills. And like he said, same shit. Like when we did Pata, he didn't give a fuck about us. Nike and shit, no, no man. And still up to date, and they come to me the whole time. And I'm on the, the we are so beautiful, I call it the other side of the table. Mm. So I'm sitting on the other side of the table. I don't have to ask them back, yo, please, what I'm for dinner. No, I'm like, nah, nigga, we're gonna do this shit. So now they have this one guy, who knows who too, Damien, that's D, D, whatever, guy from Nike, who is hired by Nike to understand us and translate the shit that he told me to death. It's a true story. He gets paid for that. And he's fighting. And I'm like, yo, my nigga, yo, no, 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 no. So, because they want to tap into the call. Of course. All marketing, whatever. And I'm going to get my bread. And it's real simple. I was tell the company, like, look, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to pump me in the ass. I know. You're going to make a couple of million. But don't give me that 10,000. I need at least 100,000. So I can teach them shit to my people. Mm -hmm. like, look, you already have 100,000. Let's go for the million. But let them, you know what I'm saying? And I make my own lane. That's what I do. I'm making my own lane and they come to me. And I think it's very important to make them. But if you don't know your, what Rick's saying, the house, you don't have your house, you don't have your shit. How can you make your own lane? How can you make your own house? The foundation. You need to know your shit. Yeah, is hip hop just a convenient moniker because of mm -hmm. relativity? Because it's something you relate to? <laughs> or is it something that you embody? Sometimes it is. Embodied. 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 It has to be embodied. Embodied. Otherwise, you can't yeah. move forward. Yeah. And what, what is really nice, what I like about this, is that it's like you need to also talk with each other more. Yeah. Like normal talks. And that's how we do in Amsterdam. And not to say that Brooklyn and Amsterdam are different, but just saying like <laughs> all the people that like my generation, the group, we all hang out, we used to hang out at the dance, mm -hmm. drinking. Talking shit, and then, and then we came up with great ideas, and then, uh, and then we got creative and sharp with lace. That's how we met him. That we had like our point. This is like this can be a, a place where we can have like you know smoke some weed, have some alcohol, whatever, chill, but then talk about serious issues and how we can you know problems help each other to go to the next step. And that's what you really need to open up. It like he's inside there, you have to open up. Yeah, remove the you know what I'm saying? all the other shit. It's a couple of generation thing, I think. Like this. I'm from the same generation and that's how we used to, that's how we grew. But it's like, I think because hip hop transcends so many, well, it's, it's grown. Hip hop is, is mature, it's still growing, growing, growing every day. Now different generations are tapping in and everybody's joining in. So you have to form a new collective thing. And also the, the, the you know, the older generation has to stop saying, well, it used to yeah, be, it problem. used to be. Yeah. They have to kick them out. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, you have to give <laughs> them. You have 100%. to see. But that, 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 that's the whole thing. So when you come in there, you be like, nah, nigga, don't even talk about like old school was better. Fuck that shit. Mm -hmm. The new shit is even better. You have more things to go to. YouTube, all that. This shit is filmed right it's here. It's just different. It's different. So it's the same energy, same vibe. But it's hard, you know, for some people to change no, the mindset and they kick, just kick, have to. Kick them out. Fuck them. Kick them out. Oh, you, have to, you have to basically. They have to learn. They yeah. have to. They will learn. Learn, 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 learn or go. Learn or go. But that's right. Yeah, so. but they will learn eventually, whether it's from the outside looking in or from the inside. You know, being part of the outside it. looking in is judgment. Yeah, judgment. Yeah, but that's the thing right. is, what it is, people forget that hip hop is like jazz music. It yeah. evolves. People they don't even are, like jazz. People want to keep it. <laughs> Keep the thing. They want to keep the thing the way it was. Yeah, remember when? No, fuck that. Fuck them. Yeah, but they have to learn. And that's no, but the they they keep them out. They, but that's what I'm saying. They hip. will learn. Yeah, but listen, but that's not hip hop. Hip hop yeah. is moving. Keep some yeah, moving. Yeah, well, you so know, that's what you say. That's what I say. I everybody that claims that we hip hop, they're not hip hop. But they ain't moving. They be stuck in the 90s. That's why they probably got here. And that's why like, they have like a kid and a wife and fucking in jail. Or some shit. What's wrong with them? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. No, but I know. You know what I mean. But that's why they're not here. Yeah. That's why they're and not a part of the culture anymore. And they, they never will be. Fuck that. I hear you. One of the important things 
I guess here is that uh, the important key, even like when you drew the uh, comparison to MMA and the fight, and the whole fight, the coaching part. Um, here's, I, I guess you're young. Aruna here, I'm pretty sure, has done a million maybe of those grants. I'm just speaking privately. But filled in those, you know, those forms. So she knows. There's people out here that have done the work before you. You don't know you need to come in and then reinvent the wheel. No, I know. I have but this is you can the from and talk to when we do this and process. Start, yeah. you know, That's this is why we process. ask our elders or people that exactly. know more about this than us. One, to uh, expand our network, which every one of us is going to call rich tomorrow, like, oh, what is this? And then we have access to his knowledge for the future. And so on, your phone is going to ring for sure after this. So it's also for us to create our network, talk amongst each other. And um, the thing is, at the Hip Hop House, we've been through those, those processes of funding. So how we feel is that we don't need another bigger building. We need more buildings for more of our people. So we have the door a little bit open, and now we're like, okay, everybody get in. And that takes a certain strategy, but also for everyone to understand, um, like there's a diversity hype going on in, in the sector, and every one of us, their phone is ringing all the time. What we don't want is all of us being gatekeepers, but being uh, not aware of, the dynamics, being stupid and selling out to all of us, basically um, catering to the sector as it is right now. We want that smartness in everyone. So if one of us gets a gig, everybody can be happy because, okay, somebody who knows what he's doing is doing it right instead of, yeah, dumbing down each other, basically. So this is why we're trying to do it. But I think the point that you made about Having coaches, I think that's the most important thing for the for the for you for the culture. Yeah. Like if I speak for myself, uh, the things I am doing right now and what I'm trying to build, I think it would be way easier with a coach, with a brother like you or with a brother like you to go back to to say like, am I doing the right things? Is this the right process? Yeah. But we're here. We're here. We're here. We've been I'm, here I'm, I'm, I'm all here. along. Yeah. I'm here. I'm right here. here. And you know, that's the problem because you've been here, but. We didn't notice, so where it's like... That's why... It's that's cool. That's and now you know. Yeah. Yeah. I've been your homeboy. I've been your man since well before today. Yeah. Even if just because I'm a little bit older than you. And I'm in the same path. I'm an independent contractor, just like you. I want more clients. I want more business. I want repeat business. I want the clients that do come to me to come back again and again and again. Because my brand represents quality exactly. not because I need somebody's fucking cosign fuck your cosign they buy my shit because it's quality the people that book me book me because next to anybody else that they book that guy's got, gonna have a long night his best bag of tricks that he presents is a flip on the fucking screen compared to what I'm gonna do to that room that is some b-boy shit that is not arrogance. That is not me passing judgment on other artists. That is me saying, when I come to the table, I came to battle. I didn't come here to just fuck around. I want to leave a fucking stain on everything I touch. And if it's people, I want to leave the people that I touch better than they were when I found them. Not because what I'm bringing is so fantastic and so great that I can give you this thing that's going to help you. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if I walk away from you and you're provoked, I got you agitated, you're going to go home and tear out some journal pages and you was writing some shit yesterday and you're like, damn, I had it all fucked up. If you can do that and be unemotional about it and reinvent your disposition about the very same point, then I've done my fucking job. I got dudes... We got dudes 20 years older than us, both of us. We come back from our, I come back from this, as amazing and beautiful as this is. The people who are grooming me to be professorial, when they see the tape, they're going to be like, oh, it was all right. Not because I didn't do a good job, but because they see so much more in me. Right? Yes. I have a question.
unfortunate about the whole consuming culture because especially with hip hop and culture culture I found that interesting because obviously you said like the established go to the neighborhood and they're like ah hip hop is interesting but in the end they will kind of buy it from you one way or the other and also you were nice like you could also buy to be kind of the, the, to say the opposite argument by I don't know Taylor made shoes from the Bronx for example, and then help the local initiatives. And especially with hip hop culture, I feel like it's a lot about, I don't know, the status of the, the clothes and the brands you wear that obviously are in, indeed from the establishment. They get the money in the end. So, how, how do you hack that system? Like, how do you make sure? Because brands are always very keen on the counterculture because that's what the kids like. So, they buy it and they own it. And even if you get a job as a, I don't know, a creative director in the end, they get the money. Right. So how do you hack that system? That's a fantastic question, how to hack that system. Uh, I grew up wearing hand-me-down shoes. I didn't have a brand new pair of sneakers until I was 14 years old. And I bought them because of my first job. So I wear Nike and branded sneakers and I like to represent myself in that fashion because I have a personal relationship with hunger. Not like, oh, I'm hungry, I'm grinding. I mean, I have a personal relationship with having sleep for dinner. Now, as a man, a little thing that puts a little fucking pep in my step and makes my heart beat fast is to have a little bit of style, you know? I know vegans that wear leather too. So, okay, you, you're doing good things for your body, but you got a leather sneaker. That's a big claim, a big expensive lifestyle claim that unless everything you're wearing is cotton and material and plastic, kind of false, right? How you hack that system? All vegetarians must not wear leather? That will never happen. We pass judgment on them for it? For what? Is it really affecting your life that much to pass judgment on it, right? The hacking of the system or, you know, I buy black, I buy black 80% of the time. Even if it's going to the establishment where the young black men and women are working, whether they own it or not, I want them to see me as a 48-year-old man come in this space, put my card on the table, my shit don't get declined, I'm asking them questions about the product, I'm asking them for their expertise or their opinion, should I get the blue ones or the red ones? I'm thinking, mm -hmm. and the dude 20 years younger than me in the store that thought I was this older guy, and what's he doing here? When I started asking him questions, he recognizes the relativity that exists between us. And when I see him on the street, outside of the store, he's like, yo, Rich, what up? Because I solicited him, you know? I, I, I don't know how to hack that system. I don't know. It's a, it's a great question, but I think it's a lofty, lofty, lofty goal. I think that there are shorter, intermittent goals that can all be met and stacked up on top of each other with a collective or a community that will trip that system up. But, you know, the people that run those things, they, they make so much money, we don't even know who they are. You know? I mean, you, man, we could go on so many angles with that, but it's, uh, it's a slippery slope. You know, materialism and being stylistic are two different things, right? Like I said before, we're all in bed with the devil in some kind of way. Say you're as unmaterialistic as you want, see a lot of $500 better watches in here, see a lot of $100 shoes, I see a lot of $200 jackets, $1,000 phones, like who's, who's not material? Who of us is not material? You know what I'm saying? Show me your halo. Where's your, where's your angel wings? They, your angel wings in the cleaner? You know what I'm saying? Like, we're all roped into these uh, 
systems that are fundamentally aren't designed for us. Wrap it up there. <laughs> wrap it up there. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Thank you guys for your time. I hope I can only hope that uh, you know put a battery in your back when I'm not here to, to be the all I see and supreme being or you know what I'm saying? Like it's, I swear on everything I love, like my, my disposition comes from passion, not from knowing at all. But I do know what I know. And I can take a punch, literally and figuratively. And I've been through a lot of shit. And you know, I see a young, bright, open eyes in here, people who want to be on the right side of history, people who want to leave their mark on shit. All you got to do is keep leaving your mark. You've already left it. Stop worrying about what these motherfuckers got. Bring them here and show them what you got. Watch the money come. Watch them come. They're coming. You know? Yeah.